let's talk, let's get cold. Okay. Um, we want to talk um, first about safety, then um, about logistics, and then about opportunities of cold weather journaling. So um, when it is cold, the phenomena that are available to us are just different. Um, if we think of what do I nature journal about uh, as being flowers and, uh, and, and, and birds and butterflies, that's not going to work out very well for you. Sometimes the birds, yes, um, but uh, the flowers aren't going to be in bloom. And so um, what some people do during wintertime is they kind of, they, they, they shut down. Um, but there's, there's tons of cold weather phenomena that we can really geek out about that are lots and lots and lots of fun. Before we do that, though, let's talk safety. Um, one of the things that, uh, and uh, we're going to be kind of throwing this topic open to um, the community. Um, I would like everybody in the chat right now to just sort of type in um, any kind of quick bullet points of safety thoughts that you think are really important about bringing your kids out in cold weather, um, um, initially for safety, secondarily for comfort. Um, the, and then with those locked into the chat, um, and don't, don't hit send yet, sort of hold off on, on hitting send, but let's kind of get a bunch and then we'll just do a dump of those. That way we're not going to lose any ideas that would have come to you. We'll, we, we hope to kind of get back to discussing the, the top ideas that are put in there. There will be a lot of, um, of, of, uh, of, 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 of things repeated in there and we'll hit those high percentage things first. And we're gonna give you about 20 more seconds to put in the top ideas that are bouncing around in your electric meat. And hit send. There we go. <clears throat> All right. We've got, we've, we've got a lot of things popping in there. Okay, this is gonna be very, 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 very useful. Um, the um, so let's let's start just with um, with uh, with some physics here. Um, so I would love to invite um, Clark and Billy Joe just to talk us about a little bit about conductive heat loss and wind chill, if you feel comfortable doing that. Is that okay, Clark? All right, so I'm going to unmute you, uh, ask to unmute and spotlight you. Hey there. Um, so talk to us a little bit about conductive heat loss. Well, um, so radiative heat loss is where you're just sort of radiating your heat out into the air. But conductive heat loss is where it's being transferred to another surface. And so sitting on cold ground um, is... Uh, that's a profound source of heat loss, or anytime you're wet, um, the conductive heat loss into, um, into the moisture itself. Um, so for my students, I've got a whole bunch of these. Each of them gets a sit pad. Hold that up. Uh, yeah. So closed cell phone, mm -hmm. um, waffle pattern, folds up nicely, um, and is waterproof, right? So that's that's that is huge. Um, in very very cold weather, you know, even from your boots on the ground, you can feel that cold coming up into you know poor footwear, and then up into the the rest of your body. But you're absolutely right. If you're sitting on a cold surface, it's it is it is not going to you, you are going to be cold really 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 fast. And a lot of times, the logistics of standing and sketching are difficult. Um, so those, that little sit upon uh, is, a, is a great thing to think about. Um, excellent. Let's bring in uh, Billy Joe. Can I bring you in on the wind chill factor? So we've got. Yeah. So coming through tail and. So we, yeah. 
<laughs> so in Ontario, we get lots of wind chills. So wind chill is when we have a temperature, which is the temperature without the wind. So maybe it's, I don't know, minus five, minus 10 and it's sunny and you're like, oh, okay, I can deal with that. But then the wind chill is added to that and it can be, it can bring the temperature down to minus 20 or even further. So that wind chill is going to create um, much more levels, uh, higher levels of exposure for your skin and stuff like that. So for, I've seen some people in the chat were mentioning frostbite, hypothermia. Sometimes it's cold enough to almost feel like it's taking your breath away, um, depending on how cold it is or how strong those wind chills in. are. Yeah, yeah, you can really feel like, woo, like it's, it's almost colding your lungs kind of thing. So it really depends. So when we look at temperatures, we always go, you know, what's the temperature and then what is it with the wind chill? And that can vary from spot to spot, depending on if you're in a school yard that is very open or you're able to find a space in the forest and get a little bit of cover from the wind as well. But then we also have to be careful because the trees are, you know, in hibernation mode. So they're a little bit more fragile. So if the wind is too strong, then we have to be really mindful of trees breaking, things like that, especially if there's ice and snow on them. So wind chill is a, is a really big thing for us here. And we do have rules within the school board. So our rule is that you, you actually physically cannot have children outside. I would believe my coworker, Christine, I see you on here, uh, is on here as well. And I believe it's minus 25, I think, is when they're just like, it's too cold for kids to be outside. So we just have to play that by ear. Sometimes we can go out for, you know, five, 10 minutes, and then we have to come back in. So it really depends. Now, those temperatures are not consistent for us, but it's something to be mindful. Um, and just going back on what Clark was saying as well, sometimes we notice here that if you have winter boots, but they're really rubber based, the rubber can actually freeze. And then you can actually have a lot of heat that's lost to your feet just with like that rubber boot, right? So really looking at the materials of the boots and stuff. So actually a number of years ago, I started wearing moccasins and my feet are just like, they're hot. Um, and there's no, no rubber whatsoever that's in them. So it's a wool liner with a leather moccasin um, and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And I find that for me, that is a much better boot for me to be wearing in the snow. Um, and they're fur lined at the top and, and all that kind of stuff, because I'm not dealing with that um, frozen rubber um, that can sometimes happen. So just different things, but like the kids aren't going to have that, right? The kids are going to have like winter boots that that they've picked up from multiple places so just really Before being mindful about where you're going yeah like where you're going how long you're going and then especially in Canada we can have fluffy snow we can have dry snow and we can have wet snow and so even looking at the type of snow that you're going out in is really going to change what that looks like and how long you're going to be able to stay out there depending on what the kiddos have right so a few different things there yeah, and uh, kind of just tagging back into when Clark was talking about, you know, if you're wet, right? Game over. Right? Yeah. It's, it, it is not going to end up well for you. Um, yeah. The um, I, I've heard the saying attributed to Inuit groups, but I don't have any um, uh uh, a good source on it other than another an environmental educator and you know how we environmental educators love to pass on things that sound like ancient wisdom and the saying was yeah. that if you are wet you will die yeah <laughs> yeah you won't you and, won't necessarily depending on what you're wearing you might not necessarily die but you'll be pretty cool if you're wearing cotton we all know that that's worth situation if you're wearing wool you can probably get away with it for a little bit longer but again there's so many different factors in winter that kind of come into play um but yeah yeah. Um, so then our, our gear for this becomes really important, right? So um, dressing in layers, uh, dress like an onion. Um, yep. um, so things to keep the wind out, things to keep the more layers you have on the inside, rather than one big warm coat, layers on the inside help hold that, that heat to the body. And also it's easier to start warm and keep warm than it is to go out, get cold, and then warm up. So yeah, and the, the other thing too, I, 
I took a, a wilderness first aid course uh, a billion years ago when I was canoe tripping. Um, and if you are able to keep your core warm, where all the organs are, this is really a spot that um, what will happen is people tend to get cold hands and feet is usually the quickest and that is usually because the the middle of the body isn't warm enough and so the body will actually shunt the blood so it pulls the blood from the extremities to pull it in to keep the inside warm so if you have are you under attack over there <laughs> oh, no this that that was a uh, a a ball that came over the fence of the school in the yard wow. next to me and hit my window but it didn't go through there you go yeah, well, at least it wasn't a bird, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, so if you're able to layer up really well in your upper body and have lots of layers, um, for me, sometimes if I do that really well, I can find that I can actually go without gloves, uh, depending on what the temperature is outside because my hands are so warm. So really understanding your body and understanding how the body works in cold weather is also really helpful uh, when dressing for the winter. That's great. That's, that's, that's very useful. Um, and usually people who live like up in Canada, you folks know how to dress for the cold, right? Most, um, most it's of something, us. <laughs> yeah. And those who haven't have already been removed from the gene pool. <laughs> um, so, um, but if, if you are, are in a place like down here in California, where people from warm areas sometimes go to the cold, or we're going to go to camp in the mountains, right? Um, so you may be getting people that are not as sort of regularly cold hardy kind of coming up to this place. So in those situations, the kind of gear that people bring with them will uh, has mu is much more likely to be kind of a substandard kind of gear. So the best thing that we've always told people in the past, even when I was canoe tripping, is try to look for natural materials that are like wool or and you can get merino wool nowadays as well which is uh it's not as itchy um or uh, synthetics will work as well but there's lots of issues with synthetics but they will wick the moisture away from your body and the nice thing with wool is that it, it will keep you warm even if it is moist or wet um but cotton i always refer to it as a the selfish uh material in that i'm sure all of us at one time in our life have had really cold feet but have pulled off our socks and said well my socks are warm but my feet are freezing and that's because your feet sweat and they pull that heat from your feet to try and dry itself so you know there's a saying up here like cotton kills because it doesn't really wick that moisture away so even if you go to like value village or the secondhand store and you're looking for other people's wool items or you know fleece and synthetics and things like that those are great ways to get it for a much better price especially if it's not something that you have standard in your closet like most of us up in Canada like that stuff standard in our closet right is to have all those pieces of gear but there is ways that you can get it without you know breaking the bank uh, to go up to the mountains for the day and things like that and have a comfortable experience and socks 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 that's my biggest thing is socks, uh, wool socks um, are, are the most amazing thing. And if you buy a pair for 20 bucks, they will last you for years and years. So wool socks are a big thing. That's great. Mm -hmm. um, Rebecca, is it all right if I bring you in to talk about some of the other medical uh, things that you were mentioning? Uh, you were suggesting, uh, you know, um, frostbite body awareness, hydration, and, uh, and snacks and things like that. Uh, there's Rebecca. Hey. Um, yeah. So, um, like Billy, I also was saying about cotton kills. You know, we're better materials to be outside. Um, being hydrated is really important to remember. I think that's easy to forget when it's cold out because like in the summer, like, oh, it's really hot, you get thirsty, but it still is super important to stay hydrated even when it's cold outside to have, um, have water bottles with you. Or I guess if it's too cold and it would freeze and I'd have some kind of warm drink available, I guess. Um, <clears throat> another tip that I, I was taught when I was little is you know if you have gloves, sometimes like pull your fingers back into the inside of the gloves and kind of put them in a fist to warm them up for a few minutes. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think just 
the the body awareness and having everybody check in with like knowing what it feels like to feel warm enough or to know when you're feeling cold and the ability to say if if you are cold or you're uncomfortable I think especially younger kids often don't have that awareness you need to um you know pause every once in a while just like hey let's all check in how is everybody feeling how cold or whatever do you feel or feeling overheated because that can happen if you have too much gear on and you're moving around and you know like you have a wool sweater and snow pants and your winter coat and your hat and all that stuff sometimes you can actually get too hot so that's what like just what jack was saying the layers are important sometimes you need to like unzip your coat and let some of the cool air in um so just the ability to to regulate that for yourself um i think kids especially need to be reminded about that that's that's really helpful um and you know those those ideas about like you know hydration and snacks that stuff is huge because that's the stuff that your body needs to kind of keep your inner fire going and so if there ever is a time for treats for your kids this is it um if you can bring a hot beverage everybody loves you um but uh if you're doing that in a school program then you might be have to have got the logistics of like maybe everybody has their own thermos i don't know how you do that but it's a little bit easier with a small family group so the um, other thing and i know this is going to sound super silly but make sure you go to the bathroom because it takes an absorbent amount of energy to keep your pee warm. So this is really important. And I always tell kids, like, make sure you're going to the bathroom before you leave. And then if you have to pee, like, tell us and like, get rid of it because it will drain the heat from your body very, very quickly. And I think Clark has his hand up as well. So excellent. Um, let's see, bring Clark. Uh, Clark, we are going to add you into the spotlight and unmute you. Yeah, I, I was just gonna add to the discussion of snacks and, and hydration, the way that I frame it to the kids, that's always fun because they get it wrong every time. I, I ask them if I stuck a big block of ice in this expedition sleeping bag, what's gonna happen to the block of ice? And they'll all say immediately, oh, it'll melt. And when you tell the kids, no, actually it will stay frozen longer, it completely blows their mind. And that's the, the opening to talking about hydration, where the actual, the food and hydration, where the, the heat comes from to begin with. Because uh, you can layer everything on, but if you haven't eaten enough and you're, you're not hydrated, you're gonna freeze. That's, I think that, that's, that's great. That's really, really useful. And that also kind of ties to the idea of kind of get yourself warm, stay warm is better than get cold and now I've got to find a way of warming myself up. That's an uphill slide. <clears throat> when the things start to go south on this, bad things happen. So yes, you know, people talk about sort of, you know, frostbite in, in digits. Um, and probably before that though, is you're going to get into early stages of hypothermia with kids. And one of the early things that happens is kids just become a little bit more quiet and subdued. And so they're not looking like a problem to you, but they're just wanting to maybe sit down, lower energy. And um, so we're kind of looking for different sort of signs that things are, are, are off. And just think about yourself, when you are cold, do you want to be going like this? like? Oh, yeah. Oh, that's really interesting. Like, no, when you're cold, you do this. Right? You're just kind of going in. And that's what your kids will be doing. So if you're trying to get them to kind of go out mentally into the world around them, and they're cold, it's not going to happen. And it doesn't happen for you. You, yourself, you're going to want to stand there like this. Right? So if that's mentally, physically where you at, they're at, at a place that's even further along like that. If you get to the, play, the point where um, if, if somebody feels confused or showing bad judgment, that's actually a later sign 
with that means that you're on a downhill slide with this and it's time to go inside and warm up, which leads, leads us to having plan B, right? So what do you do when things go wrong? Um, Billy Joe, you're regularly out in these super cold conditions. What is one of your kind of go-to plan Bs? Yeah, so just really watching the students and in most of our situations and, you know, maybe I'll get Christine to chime in. She's been at the field centers for even longer than myself. Um, and, you know, just really watching the weather and we sort of really time things out. So if it's really cold, how long are we staying outside for? And then what is the warm up? And sometimes in the wintertime, maybe that warm up is a little bit longer and then we're going to sort of back outside as well. So really sort of monitoring that time. Hi, Chris. Uh, really monitoring that time so that we are out for an allotted period of time. Also, that time is going to change depending on the students that are in front of us. And it sounds silly, but when we think kindergarten, we think, oh, they're so little, they'll probably get cold as quickly. However, their parents are still dressing them. So they actually, for the most part, come the most prepared. It's actually the students who are older are the ones that we actually have to be more considered about in our time because it's not cool to wear snow pants. It's not cool to wear snow boots. And we're coming in fashion jackets as opposed to actual winter jackets. So these are some of the things that, that you know, we as a staff are watching out for. But yeah, I'd love Chris to chime in because she's she's been in, uh, in the field much longer than I have. She's got tons of experience this one. So Yes, she does. She's oh, oh, modest, I, actually, we, we need does. to, uh, I need to, she, she hasn't been, uh, now, now you can unmute yourself. Sorry about that. Wait, there we go. There? Yes, yes. Um, no, no, Billy Joe, that, that was great. And that, that is what we look for. Um, I do want to mention that also we have many uh, families who are new to Canada and the children are coming out and being outdoors and experiencing winter for the first time. So, um, we sort of have to build, absolutely build their comfort into it so that they are getting an initial happy impression and a good impression. We don't want these children leaving and thinking winter is terrible, it's always cold. So uh, we, we ask them to help each other too. So, um, you know, we, we've all used it before. We'll say, okay, everybody do a cheek check and have them look at their friends and know what to look for, the signs of frostbite and ask them how they're feeling, check in with each other. And um, as somebody had mentioned that that's a big part of it is being very aware of what's happening with your group. And so we'll come in and we've got furs and we've got bones in here. We've got, you know, all sorts of uh, touchy feely things inside. So we'll come in, we'll sit together for a little bit, have a chat, have a little warm up time. And then we can always check out on the weather and we'll head back out of it. So even if it's 15 minutes out, 10 minutes in, 15 minutes out again, that's okay. Uh, you know, as they're getting that and we're, we're keeping things moving. And, and as you said, Jack, it really, if they're not comfortable and if they're not happy, it's going to go so really fast and and uh, we don't want that. That's yeah. most important is that the children leave here happy with a good impression. Yeah, you think about that, that ties into both their relationship with nature and the place and their relationship with you. If they know that you are really keeping tabs on their comfort and are taking care of them, that builds trust with you. And it also allows you to build an affinity with the place that you're in. Instead of that was that awful place where we were really, really cold. I hated it, right? Uh, that's, uh, that's, that's not the experience that is going to engender stewardship, right? Um, I also really like what you said about the buddy system. Um, having um, you know, somebody else that you can check in on um, with their, their, their cheeks and also just their kind of mental, mental state. Um, and what you, part of what you'd have to do with that is to then educate them about the signs of kind of some, you know, what are warning signs that things are kind of, you know, turning a little bit not good in the cold so that they know it and they can look at it, look out for it in other people. That's great. That's that's really, really useful. Thank you so much, Christine. Um, but wintertime is also this incredible opportunity 
is so much fun, right? There are phenomena. It's so good. It's so good. It's so good. Phenomenal <laughs> phenomena. Well, actually, I see Valerie has her hands up. And, and in yeah. case that this is on the previous topic, let's bounce over to her. And then let's just do a deep dive into like how much fun phenomena are in, in wintertime. So um, Valerie, I'm bringing you in here. Hey there. Um, you Now you can unmute. There you go. Yeah, hang on. Okay, thank you, and I'm very sorry that I didn't that I didn't get this in before you changed topics. But one of the things we always did was we always had a box of extra clothes on hand, and sometimes these were clothes that were like left in the lost and found for a year or two and never claimed, or you know, gloves, mittens, hats that you know maybe we got from a thrift store. But um, Billy's right. I mean, kids often don't properly dressed for a variety of reasons. So it's always good to have those those extra items to help them bundle up. And if they take them home, it's fine. You know, if they give them back, it's fine. But it's just important that in the moment they be as bundled up as, as possible. That's, that's a really good idea. Um, because and, also we want to think about equity in outdoor access. And sometimes, you know, you know, getting the full Gore-Tex you know, ensemble, um, you know, there, there's going to be a bunch of kids that this is not accessible to. So having that and kind of normalizing it, like if they see you take a scarf out of the box, then it's okay for everybody to do it. Um, the, um, and very often you will find that lost and found boxes at schools and institutions will over time pile up with really awesome gear. Right. So just get those things and wash them when they don't make that back to the kids. And you can get some gear and way too many mismatched gloves. But mismatched gloves are really fun to wear. <laughs> so we have the same thing at the field centers. We have jackets, boots, rain ponchos, you know, scarves, neck tubes, like the full gamut. Um, and, uh, you know, what, you know, snow pants or at least a wind pant something that we can extra socks, something that we can basically outfit a kid. And like Christine said, some of our students are refugees. They're coming like from Syria. They're coming from places that like they've never seen snow before. And like, welcome to Canada. You've been here for a week and now you're going to a field center. So, you know, it can be really sort of wild and they are they just, they just got here. So they don't have any of that stuff either. So equity is a big thing um, that we try to make sure that we are offering to everyone as well and giving the schools the same idea that you just had jack which is taking your lost and found and turning it into a treasure trove right which is really great that's 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 useful because also maybe you go out and you got wet mm -hmm. you come back for that little break if you can change out you're ready to go back out with a warm jacket it's dry now and we we always took the box of extras with us out into the field Oh, so that they're, yes. you know, they're always readily available. And yeah, if somebody gets wet, we can make that change right away. That is cool. That is cool. Um, that, yeah, that's, 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 that's taking care of your kids. I like that, Valerie. Thank you. So let's know, let's talk a little bit about phenomenal phenomena that we can play with when it gets cold. Right when water does this solid state thing, all sorts of wacky things happen, and there's it's really, 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 really fun. Um, so I'm just gonna um, uh, to 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 lead this off. I'm gonna to, to bounce over to uh, I went up um, after graduate school. I wanted to to reconnect with the natural world a little bit, um, and I. Um, went up to Alaska of all crazy places and played around. Um, and it was um, it was fall turning into winter. And I did a, a, a solo trek across the Kenai Peninsula. And I brought my sketchbook from that. Um, and just, you know, like all sorts of, let me, I'm gonna to go to the start of this. 
Um, so the critters are, 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 are different. I'm backpacking along. This here is, whoop, there we go. That's a grizzly track, life size, um, with these cool patterns of ice that had frozen in it. So water had gone into this grizzly track, and then the ice was making these cool swirly patterns inside the grizzly bear track. Um, the um, birds will still be hanging out with you. Um, let's see here, some other kind of, you know, fun, fun things. I found the last insect, <laughs> the last, last insect that was uh, uh, up in Alaska. Uh, this was in October. Um, but it was, I had some days that were just sort of beautiful and sunny, but um, playing with caribou and all these sorts of things. Um, you know, drawing the shapes of hailstones. Um, here is drawing um, sort of how high above the horizon the, um, the, the sun was at different times during the day for a sunrise and sunset. Um, now looking back on this, I realized I should have, I didn't know in those days about doing the one potato, two potato thing to get the, the, the height of those. Um, and then I was hiking down this, this pass and it was, there's this beautiful little landscape. Yeah, let's zoom in on that. Beautiful little landscape. And then I, it started to get colder. And um, as I was drawing, um, so here's a, an enlargement of that. These patterns here, let's zoom on that. This little kind of reticulated pattern in here, that is ice crystals forming in my watercolor as it hits the page. And then the view in front of me turned from this to this. And then to the point that I couldn't even see that mountain anymore. And I realized it was really time to kind of make my little bivouac shelter and uh, get ready for a snowstorm. And uh, tucked into my little tent, pitched my tent um, right as this blizzard <laughs> came up and, and, and hit. But um, it was just, it was really, really, really fun. Um, I have also, um, hold on a second. <laughs> I grabbed the wrong book. I wanted, hold on a second here. Are you the one, are you my little friend? Yes. Um, so tracking in the snow. Oh my goodness. So Jack, just so you know, you're, um, you're really, really zoomed in at the moment. So it's oh, hard for you. us to see. Oh, there we go. That. That's better. That's yeah, better. I appreciate yeah. that. So tracking in the snow is awesome. You get full track patterns. So not just, sometimes it's harder to see the resolution of individual footprints, but the patterns made by clumps of foots and sort of how those kind of connect together. This was an otter with a cut foot that was um, uh, uh, playing around. Um, this is, I've done tons of stuff with kids on what ice does and ice sickles are such interesting subjects for exploration. I love icicles. This is the mystery of the horizontal icicle. So this was this icicle in the school that was kind of out and down, like horizontal and then down. And then this is my kind of guessing about how that formed. Um, this is mapping the patterns of snow melt on the roof of a school gymnasium. And how the roof, how on the north, south and east facing slopes of that, the snow behaved differently. Um, This is looking at snow piling up on branches. This is the cross section of snow on branches or ice on twigs. This is looking at ice 
reverse sickles. This kids named them. I was doing this with the kids at a school. They call these things reverse sickles. These things are sticking up out of the ground, life size here. And so all of these phenomena are these, these wonderful things that we can't sort of normally play with. And um, in snowy conditions, these things, these things appear. This is musings about heat loss on ducks with air and water. Um, so um, let's, let's hear, uh, Billy Joe, can I bring you back in on this? Um, love to hear some of your favorite phenomena um, or things that when winter hits that you just like, oh, goody. Um, and let's, let's also hear from more people in our crew here. here. Oh. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So um, some things that we like to do is uh, it's actually being able to look right at the snowflakes. So if you take a black piece of uh, Bristol board and you laminate it and then take it outside so that it's cold, uh, if it's snowing out and the snowflakes land on the black uh, background, you actually will be able to see all the different types of snowflakes that are falling, which is really cool. And they'll stay on there because that paper is cold. Now, if you, it's warm and then you take it out, it'll melt. So you have to make sure that your paper is outside for a bit first. Um, tracks are a big thing here, especially at the field centers. We're very lucky. We get lots of different tracks. Um, you know, uh, that's, that's awesome. Scat is another one that we see lots of. Um, and actually many of us have even come across, it's, it's a little uh, gruesome, but actually um, kill sites are pretty awesome. And so if you can find that um, and, and discuss who do you think might've been the predator, who is the prey, why did they leave this body part and not that body part? You know, who's going to come and use it as the fur afterwards? Like, it's pretty awesome. And if you can visit the same site over and over again, it's kind of one of our highlights. It's pretty cool. Um, and yeah, it's a it's great really lesson cool. on, like, that's life, right? Like, that's life. It, it happens. Um, the other thing are some of our um, moles and voles who live in the subnivian zone. You'll often see the holes where they're coming out. So that's awesome to see like where you think they're coming out and if you can see them skip across the trail and have their little mouse prints and then diving into, you know, a tunnel on the other side is pretty awesome. Uh, we get lots of birds that stay around here all winter. Um, so that's a great one. And then um, sound when, it, when and if you are around big uh, pieces of ice you can actually hear the ice moving um, and sort of crashing and bumping against each other, which is pretty awesome. So that's a great one if you wanted to do some sound stuff um, or the sound of the wind and the snow and the different types of snow and the way they hit. Um, there's lots of really, really awesome stuff around there. Some of my favorites. Oh, those, that's really nice. Uh, let's bring Valerie back in. Um, Valerie, we're going to add you on Spotlight, and we are going to allow you to unmute. Um, uh, Billy Joe, thank you for that smorgasbord here. Hope people are writing these down because these are these are really inspiring things. You mentioned birds also. Um, if you put up a bird feeder um, near your site, it, winter birds will appreciate it, and they will come to you. Um, the uh, um, so what, what else, um, Valerie? Well, I just wanted to build on what Billy was saying. If you combine, a, if you combine a kill site with tracks around that area, then you can, you can build a story about, you know, who came into the area first, who did what, and you know what, it's okay if kids don't get it right. You know, if it's, it, I mean, who's to say anyway, but I mean, I think it's more important to get the kids thinking about what could have happened that led up to this event, you know, that happened to this kill and, and who did it and all that sort of thing. Yeah. Using the clues of the site, of the tracks around the site. I just think it's yeah. a great way to get the kids engaged and, and, um, and thinking about that. I have a couple other ideas, if I can keep going. Bring it, bring it, bring it. It's like bring a it. mystery, <laughs> it's like a mystery, right, Valerie? It's like a exactly. mystery that you're trying to solve. Like you're it an is. investigator. That's yeah, the best like part. Being a detective. And again, you don't even have to get it right. Just even 
the act of investigating and talking and engaging is the most valuable part. So yeah, it's, it's lots of fun. So I want to underscore something that Valerie is talking about here that for us as, as educators is really, really important. She's saying you don't have to get it right. And she makes that really clear to the kids. And also when you come up with an explanation that you think is really solid, we're not saying this is what happened. We're okay. saying the evidence suggests this, right? Right. right? And we're still leaving that kind of wiggle room for mm -hmm. we may be wrong. Something else could have happened, right? And mm -hmm. what we're teaching yeah is teaching people how to um, draw conclusions based on evidence, explanations based on evidence. And you're going to then support that explanation depending on the strength of the evidence for it. And it kind of gets us out of this right wrong thinking. So you don't, and the kids, you don't have to be right. The kids don't have to be right, but you want to intentionally keep this sort of Bayesian reasoning approach of you're going to sort of, as the evidence kind of pushes you this way or this way, you know, you're putting together clues to tell a story about something that happened in the past. And that's really useful. I had an opportunity in um, uh, Montana to go out with wolf trackers yeah. in winter um, who were sort of doing these sort of post-mortem kill site analyses. And they would they'd find a kill site and kind of look at how things were kind of, you know, taken apart there. And then they would track that back um, and follow the chase and figure out like the wolves were waiting here. The elk came down this way and this is how many of them were. And then the wolves came out here and then the chase went from here to here. These ones went off that way and this one, it didn't, it, it was, it's just, it's fascinating. And the thing that's great about snow is that all those stories, they're preserved for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just, I love, love, love tracking. It's one of my favorite activities. All right, but so Valerie, give us some other ideas, tasty things for playing in winter. And I'm ready for you. The other thing I wanted to suggest is hoarfrost. If, if you're familiar, hey, Billy knows what I'm talking about. Is it and a for folks that are not? I mean, this this incredible frost forms on vegetation, you know, and the the, the water particles are brought along by the wind, and then the water particles um, hit the surface and they build up, and it's just it's like it's like little teeny tiny horizontal icicles. They're not melting; they're building up. I, I'm not describing them well, but if you look up hoarfrost and that's spelled H-O-A-R. Um, it, it, first of all, it's, it's just beautiful. It is just beautiful stuff. And then secondly, the, oh my goodness, you know, the, the physics behind it is really cool. Really cool. Yeah. Thank you. This, thank is, you. One of, this is one of Christine's favorite things is hoarfrost. It's one of her favorite, favorite things. It's so awesome. It's, it's fabulous. <laughs> oh, can, can, can we just geek out also a moment about patterned ground? Pattern yeah. ground. Are you with me? Do you feel me on this? Yeah. Right. So <clears throat> when it's cold and the stuff in the, the water in the ground freezes, it can put these little vertical icicles up out of the ground that then are lifting up little pebbles. And then as those melt, they make these patterns on the ground from, and then you get these sort of successive freezing and thawing and freezing thawing events. Really interesting things happen. For instance, like if it's on a slope, the, um, here's, here's the slope and the ice comes out like this and imagine it pushing out a little pebble on the tip of that. When that melts, the pebble is going to go straight down with gravity. So with each freeze thaw, freeze thaw, all this material is moving down slope and it makes these very interesting patterns on the ground. That's, that's nuts. That's nuts. So, um, you know, the uh, geologists, geographers kind of get into the idea of gravitational wasting. Gravitational mm -hmm. wasting, you're, that's your um, uh, it's, uh, kind of geek vocabulary uh, term for the day, right? Gravitational wasting is um, 
is this is downslope material of and, and these sort of freeze thawing things can also it's like this really mm -hmm. crazy source of gravitational wasting um the uh you you've got some do you have some cool pattern ground up there by by you folks mm -hmm. uh, billy joe christine valerie yeah mm -hmm. yeah no oh actually not valerie, too I'm much up, but, but i i, I yeah. didn't allow you to unmute i apologize for that um I now allow you to. Yeah, Valerie, where are you? Where are you in the world? Uh, West Central Montana. Oh, you're in Montana. Okay, 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 okay. Awesome, awesome. And what part yeah, of Canada? So it's, yeah, it's cool. Uh, we're in Ontario. Chris and I are oh, in Ontario. Okay. Yeah, sort of like central to southern Ontario ish. It's weird. Okay. Ontario is weird. Been there. <laughs> I've been there a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Just north of Toronto, if that makes any yeah. sense to you on a map. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. So it's um, the other thing that, that is we get a lot of is because of the wind chill and stuff is like the drifting snow. Right. And so it, how it hangs. So especially north of us, like you can get like, so if you have a roof, you can actually get snow that builds out a couple of feet that hangs over the edge of the roof and mm -hmm. just hangs there so then you can get like all the i wonders of like how is that possible that it is able to do that right or you get it like it's it sort of swipes up and it like the, the drifts are pretty awesome but definitely the further north you go on some of those rooftops uh you can see some really neat stuff or the way that it's holding on some of our evergreens like little pillows right like on the evergreen so looking at the patterns in the drift i would say is is one of the cool things that we do get up here Christine, is there anything else like pattern wise that you remember? Wait, hold on. Uh, let me. Now, now you can unmute Christine. Okay, thank you. I was going to say it's it's fun to equate those things too to the different seasons of the year or different places in the world. So uh, those drifts of snow can be related to sand dunes, um, depending on where you are, the habitat you are, and uh, you know, um, different times of the year, all that sort of thing. And um, also as far as patterns concerned, uh, we always like to talk about the secrets that we're now being able to see that are revealed to us now that the seasons have changed, what's changed, leaves are down and uh, the grass is, is um, tamped down. So we're starting to see things, we're seeing nests now that we're always there, but we couldn't see them before. And we're seeing squirrel drays and we're seeing the cavities in the trees and uh, goldenrod galls. And what is a goldenrod gall? And what's hiding where? So all these little secrets that we're now able to see maybe that we couldn't see before. And again, relating that to the seasonal changes or geographical uh, differences. So again, some children might be from other parts of the world where they've never seen snow or have never seen winter. So uh, asking them to compare what's different and what's similar, what's familiar to them, all that, all that fun stuff, and which really gets uh, people chatting and noticing. It gets them noticing more. Yeah, the, the stuff that snow does is crazy. The stuff that snow does is absolutely amazing. And not just, so as it comes down, you know, you can be out there with your little, with the laminated, I li like that idea, a piece of laminated, so it's not ab absorbed, um, laminate, a laminated black card, all right? So you've got that coming down. Then you've got, how does this stuff change as it blows into drifts? And then you, some people, oh, check it out. There it is. You are ready for winter. You have, you're ready for winter. I like it. Right. But but it's also really fun that as this stuff, you know, at the kind of the end of winter, as the snow is melting, there are all of these other physics lessons that are revealed. And sometimes people like, like, you know, now the snow is just all mucky and gunky and I, you know, it's just sort of melting everywhere and things are muddy and gooey. But there's actually in that, in that time, there are all sorts of crazy physics phenomena that are, are, are popping up. So if you look at somebody's house, and this house has snow on the roof, and that house doesn't, you can tell who has good insulation in their houses, or you can tell what parts of a house are insulated. There's this roof, I'm going across here, and there's no snow on this part. 
that's where they don't have insulation. Or looking at the hood of a car, right? As you know, where where the where the metal cross beams kind of go on this, um, uh, you know that part. You know what what parts conduct warmth from the inside of the car more. You can see all of these as snow is melting. All these different lessons, north side, south side of objects. Crazy patterns happen as the snow melts. So on that little snow roof that I had, I had the north, the south, the east, the west. On those faces of the house, uh, of the of the, um, the 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 school shed, um, each one of um, you know. So here here is um, e on the east side, the snow was sliding down these little grooves on the ridges of this metal roof. And then making these as that would come off the edge of the roof would make these little curls that would hang down and curl. That was happening on the east side. On the west side, they were shorter. On the north side, they were all covered in snow. And on the south side, it was all melted. So you can make a little north, south, east, west diagram of what you think is going on with, with these sort of melting things. All these little kind of physics lessons are waiting for you to play with them as snow melts, it's making temperature visible to us in ways that it's so just like think of the temperature of the air, it's invisible, right? But with this, you can see all these patterns that relate to that. That's crazy. That's really cool. Those are phenomena that we can investigate. Another cool, yeah. Another cool thing too is that we always talk to kids too about, um, like we play a, a trappers and traders game, and and you know the kids say, well, if I don't have an ice pick to to get the ice out, I can just eat the snow. And so what they don't realize is that there's actually snow is mostly air. And so a cool phenomenon would be to actually take like a bucket of snow, fill it up and then bring it inside for them to see actually how much water is actually in snow and that you wouldn't actually be able to really sustain yourself on that. And to really understand that all that snow that's piled up that you see, you know, majority of that is air or to even do a cross section of the snow so for us we get snow and then it melts and then we get some more snow and we melt and now it's like a soils profile that you can dig down and you can see all the different layers and what's melted into it so you're looking at like maybe there was some uh, wind and there was the soil got into it or you can see where you know we had some freezing rain or whatever that is and this is really cool like soil cross section but it's snow which is pretty awesome too and, and just to bounce off Billy Joe's, I uh, just put, put a big star next to that soil, that um, snow cross section idea, um, because people who assess avalanche danger, mm -hmm. they're constantly making these snow pits. And what you do is you dig down straight and you're looking for what are the layers, right? Here's a layer of wet snow and it's right on top of this icy layer because this part started to melt and then it froze. Then we got a big layer of wet snow on that. So it's heavy on top of this sheet, high avalanche danger. And so um, the, the research that avalanche people have put into reading snow levels is really, really interesting, is really, really interesting and also can be life-saving. Should we go out across this ridge? Well, let's dig a snow pit. The people who assess avalanche danger can actually figure out like, no way are we going out there right now. That's, it looks like a nice big layer of snow up there, but that's really unstable. And I know that because of this snow pit. So the phenomena of winter, so beautiful. One more Power. thing to add in. Oh, yeah, Fowler, you go, you go, you go. I'm sorry, this is my last thing and then I'll, I'll be- No, 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 we, we, no, Valerie, we are intentionally not shutting you up, right? Okay, well, I don't want to commandeer anything. You, so we, no, you, 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 no, you're, it's, it's gold, it's gold. What the other thing that I find absolutely fascinating to think about is um, undercurrent blood flow. So when, the, when you know, on docks, and geese and great blue heron 
and all these birds are waiting around in this really icy cold water. You know, the, you know, the, the warm blood's coming down in the artery and then the heat's getting transferred over the vein and going back up to the body and the feet are cooling down and that, yeah, well, okay, Jack's got a, a page there. Um, here's what's really, you know, the nice, the other nice thing about countercurrent blood flow, I mean, you could pull in numbers like the size of the waterfowl and, you know, and it's like, how is that, how is a great blue heron different from a duck? This can bring in a whole conversation about arteries versus veins and just anatomy and physiology on, you know, which applies to all mammals, um, eat fish, whatever. And, and what's really cool is it is not limited just to waterfowl. There are other animals that have countercurrent blood flow systems like dogs. Oh, you know, so, you know, it could just lead from one conversation to the next conversation to the next conversation um, when you start looking at all that and, you know, you can bring in numbers and timing and whatever. But I anyway, know it's just a really cool phenomenon that, that I um, wanted to mention. Now I'm done. <laughs> awesome. Uh, that, that's, that's very good. I love that idea. Um, the only thing I wanted to add really quickly was, um, like snow in terms of temperature and the subnivian zone. And so if you dig down and like thinking snow is actually an insulator. So that's a cool experiment to do with kids too, to realize that although it's cold, snow is actually an insulator. And there's many animals that live under the snow for the winter because it actually keeps uh, a very consistent temperature. So that's cool too, when you're thinking about how snow is, everyone thinks it's freezing, but it's actually an insulator, which is really neat too. That's, that's really cool. Um, there's a, a really cool, uh, nice idea from Sarah to look at uh, also kind of cultural things. Um, it says that mum is from Scotland and they have a lot of different words for different kinds of snow or cold weather phenomenon. Um, kind of related to this is also the myth that um, Inuit have this huge number of words, you know, 50 or 400 different kinds of words for snow. They don't. They don't. But that is, that's, that's kind of a, a, a common myth that kind of gets repeated because it sounds really good. So we as educators, we always have to be kind of on our, 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 on the lookout for when we're kind of passing on. I think in my past, I have passed on that little piece of folklore thinking that like, did you know? Oh my gosh, that's incredible. Um, the, uh, no, it's just wrong. Um, but um, that it, it would be bring uh, fun to bring in sort of different sort of cultural looks at that. However, the whole Eskimo gazillion words for snow thing, not so much, not so much. Um, the um, and actually the, the the history of that myth is also interesting. You kind of there's some research that has been done on sort of where this idea started, and it actually started with one person. <laughs> we got that myth going, um, and uh, but oh man, so let's take a look um, into. Uh, I'm looking in the gallery. If anybody else has got a nugget that you want to uh, share, just um, wave at. Turn on your um your your computer uh your, your 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 camera and do a dance we will know that you want to share something cool um if you can't do that um any uh things in the chat um that we um have missed i think that this then um, i want to thank all of my friends here and everybody who's been also participating on the chat for um, uh, some great ideas about um, teaching in cold weather conditions. Some people say that, you know, there's no bad weather. Um, there's just like, you know, bad clothing. And I think there actually is bad weather. <laughs> yeah. And, and so, um, but, but um, in the cold, there are all sorts of wonderful phenomena that, um, that we can exploit for wonder and joy. Um, and if we're ready for that, 
we can open up that world to our, our students. Thank you all, um, uh, Clark, um, Valerie, Billy Joe, Christine, and uh, others for, uh, for your contributions um, and our thinking. Rebecca, thank you so much uh, for your insights. Um, I hope that this is a safe and wonderful and wonder-filled winter for all of you. Um, until next time, this is our Nature Journal Educators Forum. Take care, my friends. <laughs>